What's up, AP Psych? Welcome back. So we are on to our third and final set of notes for this unit on intelligence and testing. And this one is on extremes and influences of intelligence. So we're going to talk about the extreme ends of intelligence on the normal curve, including intellectually gifted and intellectually disabled. And we'll talk about environmental influences and genetic influences that can have an impact on those two extremes of intelligence. So we're going to jump right into talking about the extremes. So a valid intelligence test divides two groups of people into two extremes, right? So those with an intellectual disability, which is an IQ of 70 or lower, and individuals with high intelligence, or they're intellectually gifted, which is an IQ of 130 or higher, okay? So if you think about the normal curve, um, you know, that's just the people who fall into these two standard deviations from the mean. Um, it's less than, you know, total less than 3% of the population all throughout here and here, right? So we're talking about a very small section of the overall population when we talk about extremes of intelligence and people with giftedness and disabilities. So to start with disability, intellectual disability is having significantly below average intellectual functioning and limitations in at least two areas of adaptive functioning. Okay, so in order to qualify as intellectually disabled, you have to have limitations in at least two of these areas. That could include communication skills, your ability to interact with others, self-care, um, activities of daily living, ability to live independently, you know, um, getting yourself dressed, taking care of yourself, things like that, your social skills and how you interact with other people, similar to communication skills, um, and your community involvement, self-direction, health and safety, academics, and leisure and work. So if you are impaired um, in any one of these adaptive functioning um, categories, you know, you have to meet the, meet the threshold in at least two of them um, to be qualified as intellectually disabled. So some causes for intellectual disability, there's various ones. Um, genetics is common, right? We talked about in one example being Down syndrome when you have an extra chromosome um, that can lead to Down syndrome. Environmental factors, if we go back to development, we talked about all the teratogens um, that can impact fetal development. Um, one specifically being fetal alcohol syndrome, when the mother ingests too much alcohol, um, and it causes physical deformities, um, and even intellectual disabilities. Generally, deprivation or neglect, this can be before or after birth, can lead to issues in development um, and intellectual disability. And there are some that have no apparent or known cause that they're still investigating and trying to figure these things out. Okay, so those are some of the, uh, of the causes, genetic, environmental, um, deprivation or neglect would also fall into that environmental category. Cure, in terms of a cure, there is none yet. They don't um, quite really know how to cure these things if it's even possible, but there are some preventative measures for certain types of in uh, intellectual disability. Right? So there's tests performed on newborns um, for hidden genetic disorders such as PKU. Um, that's when infants and newborns can't process protein. So if they detect that early enough, they can avoid the intellectual disability that's associated with it um, because they can start implementing a special diet, right? So they might be able to de detect things early and be able to avoid certain situations based on environmental factors. But more generally, there's genetic counseling before you have a child or during pregnancy. Um, there's pregnancy care services and education for new parents and other preventative strategies. So the more parents know, um, before they decide to have kids or while they're pregnant, they can help improve their odds that um, intellectual disabilities can be avoided. Just to break down intellectual disability a little bit further for you, there's different levels. Okay, so there's four levels. Mild is 50 to 70 IQ range, right? 85% um, of all um, intellectually disabled people fall into this mild category. Okay, so their academic abilities are at approximately a sixth grade level, and they can learn to live on their own, hold their own job, and be relatively independent with an IQ score around that 50 to 70 range, mild. Once you get into moderate, you're dropping pretty low into the into 50s to 35 IQ score, and this means your academic abilities are approximately the same as a second grade level. Um, you can be trained in self-care. You can acquire some reading and writing skills, but you're going to need supervision and help, right? If you think about a, sec a second grader and the level that they're at, they can take care of themselves in some ways, um, but most of their life they're going to need supervision and assistance. Then when you get into the 34 to 20 range of IQ, um, 
your mental capacity is approximately that of a five-year-old or a kindergartner. Um, you can learn to talk, obviously, in most cases, and perform simple tasks, yet you're going to need close supervision and day-to-day -day life assistance, right? assisted living um, in most instances there. And then when you get into our last category, um, anything below 20 is profound intellectual disability. And this is a mental age less than three. These people are going to be very limited in their communication if they speak at all. Um, they're going to require constant, all the time supervision. They're usually going to have numerous physical disabilities as well because of um, the impact of their mental um, disability. So those are the four levels on one extreme of intellectual disability. Now, on the other extreme, you have intellectually gifted, and these are IQ scores above 130 to 135, right? So that would be two standard deviations above the mean of 100 if our standard deviations are 15 points. So the most extensive research on giftedness was done by Lewis Terman, right? We talked about him with our intelligence theories, and the resulting data of, um, of much of what we know about the subject comes from his studies, right? He studied 1,528 students near the top of IQ range into adulthood, and he found that those gifted children typically excel in school, overall good have overall good health, and were generally happy, right? Interestingly, one of the best predictors of success and happiness in life is your IQ score. Um, newer research suggests that highly gifted children may be susceptible to certain physical or psychological disorders, um, so it's not necessarily all great, but if you think about those typically high-scoring people um, if they encounter something that's too difficult for them to overcome or they experience failure for the first time in their life because they've things have come so easily to them, um, that can lead to bouts of anxiety and depression and some of those psychological disorders that can result from that because of the stress it causes. And they're not used to that failure or that challenge because they've been so gifted their entire life. However, for the most part, most of them continue on a path of success um, and they, you know, for for all intents and purposes, purposes lead, a, lead an ordinary life, undistinguished life. Um, they're just very intelligent and tend to be successful and happy, right? It's not like they're just because you're intellectually gifted, you're going to be the next Einstein or something like that. Uh, most people just lead normal lives and enjoy them. So how are these two extremes impacted by genetics and your environment? So there's no other topic in psych that is so passionately followed as the one that asks the question, is intelligence due to genes? genetics or the environment, right? So we're circling back to that classic psychological debate of nature versus nurture, and it's hotly debated in the realm of intelligence. So first up, we'll talk about genetic influence. So let's, we'll go back to twin studies, which we've gone over during development. Twin studies, um, family members and adopted children together, all of those groups support the idea that there is a significant genetic contribution to intelligence. Okay, so if you look at our graph here, here's a correlation. Um, and you can see that identical twins raised together have the strongest similarity of intelligence scores. You know, they're very positive, strong, positive correlation. We're getting up there towards almost a, a perfect one in terms of correlation. Our next group, identical twins reared apart, meaning they have the same genetic code, but they were raised in different environments. Their score is a little bit lower. Their correlation is a little bit lower. Right? It's still a strong correlation, but this tells us that there is, there has to be some type of environmental effect on intelligence because twins raised together and twins raised apart, they still have the same genetic code. The only thing that's different is their environment. So their environment has to have a little bit of an impact right, in that gap there. Then we go to fraternal twins reared together. So they're not genetically identical, but they're raised in the same environment and they still have um, a stronger positive correlation. Right? But their lower correlation than identical twins shows genetic effects. Right? Because we know that they're not identically the same in terms of genetics, but they still score highly and similarly right? in the same environment. So that points towards our genetic factors. Some other genetic influences, we've talked about studies of twins that pointed towards genetic influences. We talked about James Bouchard and his study of the gym twins. Um, and how, you know, they married the same woman with the same name. They both divorced. They married a second wife, who was both also named Betty. Um, one named his son James Allen. The other named his son James Allen. Both named their pet, uh, their pet dogs Toy. So all of these interesting genetic influences on development and intelligence point towards 
a major genetic factor in um, intelligence. A couple others. Other research supporting these genetic influences. Um, studies of identical twins have shown a stronger correlation in IQ scores when compared with fraternal, fraternal twins, right? Adopted children tend to have a more similar IQ to their biological parents than their adoptive parents, which is evidence for a genetic factor. And research coming out of the Human Genome Project has also suggested that intelligence has a genetic component. Um, and scientists point out that a genetic basis of intelligence is complex because it involves the interaction of many genes. Okay, so they're looking for those genes that um, would point towards um, how we our intelligence is developed genetically. But there's going to be a lot of them, and it's going to be complex once they find them. It's going to take some time. They're still working on that. Now, on the flip side, environmental influences also do have some impact. Okay, so studies of twins and adopted children also show greater similarity in IQ scores of those individuals reared together than those reared apart. Okay, so that means your environment and where you're raised is having an impact on your IQ score. Those who are raised together have more similar scores than those raised apart, which means the environment has an impact on your IQ. One specific place, the schooling effect. Um, schooling is an intervention that pays dividends reflected in intelligence scores. Right? Increased schooling is related to higher intelligence scores. The more school you get, the higher your IQ. Um, and that's been shown in study after study, right? So when you get, you get through high school, if you get a bachelor's degree, then you go to master's degree, PhD, whatever, the more in, often the more in, um, education you receive, the higher your IQ will become, okay? So to increase readiness for schoolwork, projects like Head Start can facilitate learning. That's been a huge part of trying to up um, general intelligence across the population, getting kids into school sooner and getting them into the structure that they need. Now, the controversy surrounding these genetics versus environment. Um, studies have been done comparing different ethnicities, social classes, and adopted children trying to prove impact of genetics or environment on the scores of these different groups, right? So they're trying to show differences in social class, race, adopted children. Um, and there's been no solid evidence really either way, but some evidence suggests that environmental changes can influence IQ scores of children in deprived situations. So one of the biggest examples of this is a, a child called Jeannie Wiley. If you wanna hear or read about a crazy story, look up her, her story. But um, when she was a baby, her father pretty much chained her to a child's toilet or bound her in her crib. And essentially after that, cut off all human interaction with her, which is insane. Um, and you know, she was found at the age of 13 um, severely malnourished and she didn't, she missed the critical periods of language. She never interacted with anyone. She didn't know how to speak. Um, and she, you know, had, was fine throughout the pregnancy, right? But when she was born, the environment in which she was raised in completely deprived her of all stimulation. And it greatly impacted not only her development, but her intelligence and IQ as well. So that's just to show you that in certain severe situations, environments have a huge impact. Now let's talk male versus female in terms of IQ. Um, males and females average the same overall intelligence score, right? So let's get that out of the way. Men and women, there's not much of a difference. They're about the same on average. There are some differences in specific abilities. Females tend to score better um, in verbal tasks. They're better at locating objects and detecting emotions, okay? Higher emotional intelligence and verbal intelligence. Males score higher in spatial abilities um, oftentimes that means mathematical reasoning and problem solving, and they show higher variability in their scores than females. So they have the same average, but women are much more um, concentrated around the mean, while men may have you know, more intellectually gifted people and people who suffer more um, intellectual disabilities. They're much more spread out across their um, spectrum. So when we talk about intelligence tests, this is a hot topic issue is our intelligence tests biased. So aptitude tests aim to predict how well a test taker will perform in a given situation, right? We've talked about those tests. So they're necessarily biased because they're sensitive to performance differences caused by your education and experience, okay? Your education and experience background is going to influence how well you do on an aptitude test. So there is a little bit of bias there towards people who are more educated. 
So could a student who recently immigrated from Romania score lower on the SAT than a student who was raised in America? Absolutely, right? Even if we would say that that Romanian student is a much better student, has a higher IQ, they're taking the SAT in America, right? They don't necessarily know the language, the culture, the references. So how do we fix that? Should we do something about it? How can we fix it, right? That's the question that's being asked. How do we make sure that these tests are both reliable and valid and fair for all people who may be taking them? And that's a tough question to answer. In the scientific sense, um, that a test predicts less accurately for one group than another, research has shown that aptitude te tests like the SAT and the ACT are unbiased in the sense that the test's predictive validity is roughly the same regardless of race, class, or gender. So it's meant to predict your success in college. And it's shown that regardless of race, class, or gender, it is predictively valid for those, um, for all groups. Now, recently there have been arguments that we should do away with tests like the SAT and ACT and base things off of your high school GPA as a predictor of success in college. And what they found is GPA is the best predictor of success in college. Um, SAT and ACT are good predictors, but they're not as good as GPA. However, the best predictor, um, the thing with the most predictive validity is combining your GPA with your SAT and ACT score. So these things are still useful um, and they are very solid in their predictions that they make. The very last thing we talk about here, this is something to be very careful about when we talk about intelligence, is stereotype threat. And stereotype threat um, is a self-confirming concern that one will be evaluated based on a negative stereotype. And this affects performance on all kinds of tests. Okay? However, it only occurs when the stereotype is activated. Someone would have to express the stereotype prior to testing in order for it to occur. So here's an example. They've done a few studies on this where they ask white students to take a certain math test, right? But before the test, the proctor says, well, you know, um, Asian students tend to do much better on these math tasks than white students. So what happened there is the proctor activated the stereotype, right? And when those white students were taking the math test, they did significantly worse than the control group who, whose stereotype threat was not activated, right? So it's interesting in the sense that um, someone has to express that stereotype in order for it to impact the people who are taking the test. Otherwise, there's generally... Um, not a negative impact, right? Unless you bring up the stereotype and think about it before you're asked to do something. To give you another example, let's say a girl named Julie is about to take the SAT math portion. And before the SAT math portion, someone tells her, well, you know, men, men and boys do so much better on, in mathematics on the SAT than girls do, right? They've activated this stereotype. Um, and even though Julie is a gifted mathematician who would theoretically ace the SAT math section, she performs much poorly than she would because that stereotype threat has been activated. So when we talk about um, intelligence tests, we have to be very careful um, to not perpetuate stereotypes and not share stereotypes with people um, because it can impact the way that you score and the way that you do on your um, intelligence tests. You know, you might score lower than you would even though you have the capability to do much better because of things like stereotype threat. Right? So that wraps up are intelligence extremes, talking about intellectually gifted and intellectually disabled, and the impact that environment and genetics have um, on intelligence in general. So as usual, let me know if you have any questions, and we'll see you in class.